the reason I started this whole project that led to a book on the Sermon on the Mount was because I was preparing for a teaching trip. I was planning to go do some Bible training for a group of Maasai pastors in southern Kenya. I'd been there a couple times before, so I had a, a decent sense of where the guys were at. And I decided I wanted to do just some lessons on basic Bible interpretation. Just looking at the nuts and bolts principles for understanding the Bible. Now, when I've seen this done before, usually we just jump all over scripture, just cherry picking whatever verse happens to illustrate an exegetical principle really well. But that always felt like cheating to me. I mean, if this stuff is legit, it should work with any text, right? So my idea was to pick just one text, like maybe a few consecutive chapters, and use that as our running working text for applying the principles of interpretation. Well, what text was I gonna use? Jesus' most famous sermon seemed like an obvious choice. But when I started preparing the lessons, I hit a serious problem almost immediately. This sermon demands application. I was memorizing the sermon and working on all the little ways to analyze it exegetically, but I would come across something Jesus says and a voice in my head would say, you aren't doing that. And I couldn't just ignore it and go about my business because this sermon that I was presuming to interpret explicitly says, don't do that. At the very end, it says, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man. So pretending to interpret a passage without facing the ways it was challenging me was a farce. It was just bad interpretation. If you don't try to apply what Jesus says in this sermon, you haven't heard him at all. He says that these teachings are the path you want to be on. This is the way of life. He says that this way of living provides the only foundation that can stand up to the storms this life will throw at you. So this sermon carries two challenges, hearing it and doing it. Hearing it is hard because this sermon will challenge you in every way you don't want to be challenged. There are things in your psyche blocking the ability of the life of Christ to flow through you. Those things can run very deep. Calling them out to challenge them can feel vulnerable, dangerous, maybe even impossible. If something in this sermon strikes you that way, that is exactly where Jesus is trying to work in your life. But Jesus can't heal you if you're not willing to surrender to him. And you can't surrender an era of your life to him if you're not even willing to look at it. So hearing the sermon is the first trick. Doing it is the second. And in doing it, there is paradox here. If you try to do it on your own power, you will fail. I mean, we're, we're talking about taking on the heart of God. That's not something you can do on your own. However, surrendering to the work of the Spirit, abiding in Jesus, and following the Spirit's leading can still feel like unbelievably hard work. But when you seek Him in an area where you need growth, and by His strange ways, he leads you to the resources and tools and voices you need to help you out, 
you will know with absolute certainty that he is the one who accomplished this healing in your life. Are we talking about the old paradox of grace versus works? Fine. Let's hear what the guy who wrote, it is by grace you have been saved, said. In 1 Corinthians, Paul said, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace towards me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them. Though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Maybe Jesus said it best. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they will be filled.